Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Rebecca, Community Relations Director from Amica London, and our other hostess is Julia, Community Relations Assistant from Amica Westboro Park. We would like to welcome you to our seventh national virtual event. Today's topic is a very popular one, downsizing and design. We have over 500 attendees today. As we're such a large group, we have turned off your sound and your video. Please note that due to COVID-19, we have asked our speakers to present from the safety of their own home or office using webcam. You may hear pets, children, or other noises in the background that are outside of the speaker's control. We ask for your understanding and patience. Following the presentation, Julia will ask our guest speakers, Claudia and Terry, a few questions that were sent in ahead of time. If there's enough time remaining, we will happily address any questions that you, the listeners, have submitted in the chat. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first guest speaker. Claudia Salgado oversees all aspects of design of Amica's premium senior living residences. Her professional career in architecture includes 15 years at Amica and extensive experience as a senior architectural design uh, designer at a top Toronto firm. Ms. Salgado holds multiple architecture degrees, including a Bachelor of Architecture professional degree from the Lawrence Institute of Technology and a postgraduate degree in design from the same university as well as a master's degree in dementia studies from the University of Stirling, where she's now part of a research team focusing on retirement care environments. She has received, received prestigious academic and professional awards, such as being named Minoru Yamasaki Scholar and appointed to the Lambda Loda Tau Honor Society. As a licensed architect, she is a member of the Ontario Association of Architects a member of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, a lead accredited professional, and a member of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada's Age-Friendly Housing Options Task Force. Please welcome Claudia. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for that kind introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here this afternoon joining this discussion. And I think that through the marvels of technology, it's fantastic that so many people from different time zones, different locations are able to join. Before I start uh, the gist of my presentation and we've, before I dive into the different topics that we're going to try to discuss this afternoon, I would invite you to do a quick mind shift. And rather than thinking about this topic as downsizing, I would invite you to do a mind shift and use the word right sizing. Because what I'm hoping to do is that through today's discussion around design and the ability of design to personalize your space, I think that you will be able to understand how design can not only be a fun uh, endeavor, but also a way to personalize your, your milieu. So with that in mind, let me cover the different topics that we will be discussing this afternoon. I thought it would be a very good idea to first introduce you to how Amica approaches design from a design philosophy, how we believe that design is a holistic experience where it, it, it's not only what you see, it's what you see, what you hear, the ambience that we try to create, and how for us, interior design is more than just the core. After that, we will start focusing on what I am sure will be one of your most uh, interesting uh, parts of the conversation, which is how does this apply to my own suite? How can all of this that I'm hearing about design can come back and be a useful tool for me as I embark on this new chapter of my living environment? And lastly, I am going to give you some takeaways some tips that hopefully you will find useful. So I hope that this is uh, something that you will find fascinating. I would like to start by talking about our design philosophy. For us, I think one of the things that places us 
above, beyond, and, and differentiates us from uh, other operators is the fact that for us, design is very resident-centered. By that, we mean that there are different touch points throughout the design process in which feedback, direct feedback from both operations, from resident groups, from community advisory groups, make it back to the design table. We do post-occupancy evaluations. We go back to our residences six, 10 months after we've opened, a year after we've opened, and we do a quick uh, forensic audit to what we've done. And we try to gauge what is working, what wasn't as successful as we thought it would be, and how we can improve. This means that our approach to the sign is not only resident-centered, it's not only directly linked to operational feedback, but it's also constantly innovating. Because by racing and allowing different ideas to come forth, we are in a way prompted to see what else we can do, how else we can push boundaries. Above all, we truly believe at Amica that design has to be contextual. Just this afternoon, we have attendants uh, calling in from Vancouver, from Calgary, from the eastern coast of uh, Canada. So, we, can, we do not believe in an approach to the sign that it's a cookie cutter. We believe that each environment has its own personality and needs to be tied to the immediate community and needs to be contextual. And for that, we obviously focus on the best locations in the finest of neighborhoods. These are some of the examples that we have brought to life through the implementation of this philosophy. As you can see from this screen, Amica Lions Gate, which is in West Vancouver, has a very different feel than, say, Amica Bronte Harbor, located here in Oakville, Ontario, where there is a very marine feel to it, or Amica on the Gorge, which is on Victoria, and it becomes more of a countryside uh, expression to architecture. Other examples, Amica London, Amica Dundas, showcasing how by us selecting the right site for these residences, we can provide beautiful exterior amenities. We can provide residences that are close by to a main street, that are walkable, that the whole context of where the residence is located becomes an amenity for residents to enjoy. As I was trying to allude in my introduction, for us, our approach to design is very holistic. And by holistic, I mean that design and the senses are very linked together. Design is not only what you see, what appeals to you. Design is what you touch, the finishes you touch. It is the texture, it is the acoustics. It, within the Amica residence, there are moments of a lot of activity, but there's also moments of quiet reflection. There's also spaces that will energize you, spaces that will want to prompt you to join into different activities, but also throughout the residence, we do have quiet spots, quiet corners where someone who wants to have a more personal and intimate experience can use. We achieve this through a layer of decisions, be it the artwork, be it the colors we're using, be it the type of materials we're using. We accessorize in a way that the accessories also speak to the context. If we're in the West, if we're close to the Pacific Ocean, like we are at Amica White Rock, you will note that most of our artwork has a resonance to marine life, to the West Coast aesthetics. If you are in a residence that is more in the urban context of downtown Toronto, say, for example, Amica Balmoral Club, it is a very different aesthetic that speaks more to an urban uh, delight. Overall, for us, interior design becomes a very powerful tool to achieve these philosophical objectives. For Amica, design and interior design per se is a science. We go through room by room, 
analyzing, as you see at the top right hand corner of your screen, where we put together all the finishes that make up one room, be it the carpet, the wall covering, what kind of countertops we're going to use, what is the colorway, what is the palette, and we start to weave together room by room, bringing in all this richness of texture, of color, of experience with very tastefully appointed uh, furnishings to create what it is truly a premium experience. Now, I am sure that one of the reasons why you have joined this uh, conversation this afternoon is because you are thinking about coming and selecting your suite. So, you know, I would like to spend the latter and the best part of my presentation talking about suite design and how within all this context of design philosophy, how do we bring it from the macro to the micro level of the suite you will select, the suite that will feel right for you. So one of the things that we try to do very hard is to stay within neutral palettes. What does a neutral palette mean? It means that it becomes a very quiet background, a very quiet elegance that will allow you to bring in colors and textures and expressions that are going to be your own, your very own. In selecting all these finishes, we have one thing top of mind. We want these finishes to show well, to be residential, and to feel like it is part of, or an extension of your home environment. So within this very quiet, elegant palette, we are allowing the freedom and the ability and, and what should be a very exciting approach to personalize your suite. You will see from the images shown on this slide that most of this neutral palette is in the beige, the taupes, the off-white. That doesn't mean that coming in and once you have selected your suite, if this is just too subdued that you cannot change the color of on the walls or you cannot further personalize, but think of this as a blank canvas. Think of the neutral palette of the suite you will select as the blank canvas that is waiting for your creativity, it's waiting for your energy, and it's waiting for your design eye. So there is a sweet style for everyone. And what do I mean when I say this? We have a myriad of different suite layouts that many times are informed by either the opportunity of the geometry of the building of the floor plate, or simply there has been a market study and there is a desire for full kitchens or larger suites. So within the gamut of suites that we have, you will note, even from the, the uh, visuals that I've decided to, to uh, share with you on this slide, that say, for example, if you are into cooking, what is going to be right for you as you right size this next chapter of your life? Is it gonna be a full kitchen? Do you expect to be cooking? Do you expect to be baking? Or are you gonna be happy with just a kitchenette that, you know, you've had it, you, you, you've, hooked all your life and you are at a point where you are looking forward to experiencing fine dining in one of our beautiful dining spaces. It is up to you. It is for you to start thinking, what are your needs? What are your preferences? Where do you see yourself enjoying your time within your suite? What feels right for you? What becomes important for you as you start touring and as you start discerning which is the suite that is the right suite for you. So you can say, well, you know, it sounds easy. I mean, but how do I make it my own? Well, my first advice would be, you should take a look around as you start to right size. And as you start this journey of decluttering, you know, start to analyze and start to highlight and pinpoint what furnishings are dear to you? What art pieces speak to you? What mementos of your life mean something to you in terms of knickknacks, in terms of things that you've collected that when you look at it, it speaks to you? So 
I would say that that's one of the first things you start to, to do. You start to go through your things and you start to make a very, very high level uh, assumption of the things that you would like to keep. What things are valuable? And as a tip, bring less. You can always add more, but I would say try to have a disciplined approach and try to bring less. And once you've started doing this right sizing, once you've started designing your own suite, then you will be able to identify corners, gaps, a certain wall that is just crying for a feature. You would probably, and I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that you may be thinking, well, how do I begin? How do I start? I mean, what she's saying makes perfect sense, but where do I begin? And I'm going to tell you, you know more about design that you actually may believe you know. We make design changes every day, throughout the day. From the moment you wake up, from the moment you decide to put a certain, uh, you know, a symbol of uh, garment, by the, from the time that you decide what makeup to wear, what jewelry to put on, what earrings to wear, when you put on a, a suit and you make a selection as to what uh, tie you're going to pair with the suit, when you decide what socks you're going to use with what kind of shoes, these are all design changes, uh, these design choices that, in a way, they're so embedded in you that you don't realize that these are indeed design choices. So my recommendation is gravitate and start selecting the things that, A, they make you feel good. And we all have that piece of artwork. We all have that knickknack. We all have that favorite chair that makes us feel good, that makes us feel comfortable. You know, things that I'm sure most of us had friends say, oh, I saw this, I brought it for you because it's just so you. The challenge here that you should put yourself to is define your style. What makes your style you? What speaks to who you are, to how you want to live? how you want to show yourself to others. What is your style? Are you a minimalist or are you a romantic? Are you Victorian and you keep every single, you know, uh, rose petal that you you dehydrated from a special occasion? What makes you feel good? And in doing so, how can you express your own design style? Once you start looking at your suite, you will note that there are zones, and let's call them zones. We have the living space zone. So these are some examples of uh, different suites that are the living spaces and the suites. You will note, as I explained earlier, that the context, the background is very neutral. So with neutral furniture, you enhance the lightness of the space. But one of my tips, one of my recommendations would be for each space, choose a dominant color. Choose a color that's gonna be your color way that you can develop and that you can carry, be it through art on the wall. Say for example, the first couple of slides show a tendency to lean towards the oranges. You see the orange and the reds being reinforced by the artwork, by the toss pillows. So choose a color that, that you're comfortable with. Choose a color that you want. Select an accent piece that you can work around, that you can celebrate that accent piece. And you know, consider, above all, that the rest of the building, the common areas, the common dining areas, the common lounges, the bistro, the greenhouse, these are all extensions of your living space. So this is why it shouldn't be downsizing, it should be right sizing. This is your living space, but yet you have outside of your sweet door an entire world of amenities that are there for you to use. So try different layouts. Give yourself, allow yourself the opportunity to be wrong. I tell you, 
from that intro, you would think that for me, the sign is easy, that for my team, we go there and we get it right the first time. It is so far from the truth. I tell you, as much as we have experienced staging, designing, doing the turnovers of many, many buildings, and we've been doing this for many years, we always make mistakes. We don't get it right the first time around. So allow yourself that freedom to make a mistake. Allow your the freedom to try different layouts. If something doesn't work out, move it around until you get to a living space that you feel comfortable with, that works for you, that works for your needs. Another uh, very important zone is the bedroom. So in the bedroom, again, think when you are looking at different suites, what is going to be useful for you? What size of bed do you need? Start with the very, very basic questions. Do I, am I good with a twin size bed? Do I need a double bed? Or you know what, I'm used to large beds. I, at least, I need at least a queen size bed or I've, I've slept on a king size bed all my life. I'm not gonna give it up now. So start by that. That should be your first decision when you're looking at your bedroom. What size of bed am I going to be bringing from home? What is your preferred view? Some people do not like to look out the window as soon as they wake up. Some people do. Maybe you want to be closer to the access to the washroom. Maybe you want to be next to the window. What is your preferred view? What are your daily routines? What are you going to be more comfortable with? And one tip that I would recommend, as you can see from these different uh, photos that I'm sharing, I would suggest that you use your bedding as the anchor to the decor. Your bedding can be the accessory, the most beautiful accessory in your bedroom. And you can use toss pillows to elevate the bedding. So as you can see, through the bedding, we're introducing pattern, we're introducing dominant colors, and we're just throwing pillows to make it a little bit more fun. Takeaway suggestions. The first one that I would like to, to reiterate, this is your personal space. This is where you are coming to feel comfortable and this is the space that you are claiming as your own. Your suite is your personal space. Determine your style. You know, are you super formal? Are you conservative? Are you a modernist? Are you, uh, you know, a flower child that you like, you know, macrame and you like a lot of plants in your room? Determine what your style is identify what makes you comfortable what's going to be easier easiest for you anchor every space with something be it a beautiful memento from a trip being a beautiful art piece being a beautiful piece of furniture be it in a, a beautifully embroidered uh, toss pillow or a gorgeous uh, portrait of your family anchor each space with something that calls people's attention be practical be practical you know put yourself under this discipline and i think that terry is going to talk to you a little bit more about this of how being practical can really make this transition much easier above all have fun with it design should be fun this should not be stressful this should be an opportunity for a fresh start to maybe organize your living space like you always wanted to, to have it. This is your opportunity. Take this opportunity to make this space your own and to have fun with it. Thank you very much for the opportunity of me being able to share these with you. And uh, back to you now, Julia. Thank you so much, Claudia, for sharing your fantastic insights and tips in the world of design. Claudia will be back with us shortly for our question and answer session. I'm so excited to introduce our next speaker, Terry Brown. 
She will be sharing her knowledge and expertise in downsizing. Terry spent most of her career in the financial industry helping her clients with their investments and estate planning. After her long and successful career, Terry saw a need to help seniors downsize. So over 15 years ago, Relocate Stress-Free Incorporated was formed. Relocate Stress-Free Incorporated is a full-service moving company specializing in downsizing seniors, decluttering services, storage solutions, estate dispersals, and sales. Please welcome Terry Brown. Okay, everyone, I'm here. Thanks, Julia, for that introduction, and uh, this is really exciting. Um, we are able to talk to so many people across the country and uh, be able to reach out and help everyone. And today, I'm going to talk about downsizing, but not downsizing your home, basically downsizing your stock. So we are going to start with what to do with all of your stuff. Now, um, you may be wondering, um, what are you gonna do with it all? And where can it go? And what is it worth? Also, who's gonna help you with all of this stuff? So, I've been doing this for a long time, and I can tell you the best case scenario is always if you can move first. Um, just like Claudia said, you're going to pick out your bed, the right bed, the right items for your living room, your favorite pieces, everything that you want to take to your new space. So you're going to make sure that you've got a list and you've um, worked with a floor plan if possible and make sure you've got everything you need. And if you can't move first right away, um, then just make sure you've got those pieces identified so you know that you're going to take with you what's most important. So the biggest thing that I hear from my clients is, okay, so we're gonna deal with everything that's left over. It's preserving those memories. When you're moving from this house that has so much history and so many items that are dear to you, how do you preserve those memories? Because you're not gonna be able to take them all with you. And my suggestion for that is, most of the seniors I know um, all have iPhones now or iPads and they can take a picture of those memories or those items or something, uh, a certificate that you received during your lifetime or it's an item that um, you know someone gave it to you and you can't take it with you. So take a picture of it. And then the other thing you can do, and I've seen this done, where you can take those pictures and have it made into a book. So that when your granddaughter comes over or your grandchildren, you can sit down or a friend that hasn't doesn't know anything about your history, you can sit down and go through your book with them. So the everything that's left over, here's the things that you can do with it. And we're going to go into detail about how to do all of this. So you can sell things that have value. You can donate things that can't be sold. There's things that maybe you can't sell or donate, but you don't want to get rid of right away, you can store them, not always ideal, and recycle where possible. And of course, the landfill is the last resort. So we're gonna go through each of these areas for you. Okay, so where can I sell my things? Um, what's very popular right now is online auctions. They're extremely popular right now. Um, I just want to make sure Julia is trying to get a hold of me. Why is that? Oh, just want to make sure all technical is good. Sorry about that. Um, so we can go to an online auction. And at one time, you can see I've got live auctions on there. And at one time, you used to be able to just take all your stuff to a live auction. You used to be able to go to that auction. You used to be able to go into the crowd. And whenever there was something that you wanted to buy, you could put your hand up and you could buy it. Well, I don't know how it is across Canada, but I know now here in Calgary, there are no more live auctions. They are all online. The only live auctions you will see now are implement or farm auctions where, of course, you can't put those things into a building. Um, because it seems like 
everybody is worried about the space that they have, so they've decided now that they're going to do these auctions online. Next step is consignment stores. Um, consignment stores work really well, but I always like to make sure you understand all the details. Usually what happens with consignment stores is that you go to a consignment store, you drop off your things, they will try to sell it. After a couple of weeks, if for whatever reason it doesn't sell, they're going to lower the price. And then after that, they'll lower the price again. And if it still doesn't sell, they are going to ask you to either come back and pick those items up, or they're going to ask you to send them, um, if they can send them to a charity. Something else that's very popular now, it just seems like, I think mainly because of COVID, is uh, these personal online sites like the Kijiji and the buy and sell sites where each little community has a buy and sell site and, and everybody is posting things that they found in their home that they don't want anymore and now they're selling them on these on, on, online sale sites on their own. Um, these are okay. Um, as a senior, if you're alone, I'm not sure if you want to do this type of a sale. Um, and have strange people come into your home. If you have someone that can be at the home with you when you're actually having someone pick something up, then that would be fine, but um, a lot of people don't want strangers coming to their home, so it's not the most ideal. The other one is online estate sales at your home. So that is where an estate auction company will come in, price everything in your home, and post it and have a sale where people come through and buy everything in your home. Usually with the, on, on, with the estate sales at your home, um, most of those, they want a fair amount of items to sell. Some of the higher end estate sale companies want at least $25,000, $30,000 worth of items to sell. Um, there are a few out there now, smaller estate sale companies that will do it for as less as $5,000. So what they do is they will take 50% of the sales and then you get the other 50% and they will have that sale at your home. The other area is, let's just say that you've got some special jewelry or you've got some really old coins pre-1967, 66. Um, you've got a, a book collection or a stamp collection. Those are specialty venues, and how we've used those specialty venues in the past is you can take those items to that specialty venue, and they will actually look at it, they will value it, and they will offer you a certain amount of money, and then they will write you out a check. So those are for the specialty venues. Um, and you can always sell things to your family or your friends. I always say if you can try and sell some things that way, it's probably going to be the least expensive for you. Because whenever you are taking things to an auction, if you're not having an on-site sale, there's a cost for that. So what can you expect from selling your stuff? Well, I can tell you this. This is probably the hardest part of my job, is I have to tell people your stuff isn't worth that much. And it's the hardest thing. I mean, there are some things that hold their value, but in most cases, it's really difficult now to sell secondhand items. You can get a professional appraisal. If you are getting a professional appraisal, usually what will happen, two things. They can come in and just do a walkthrough and give you a verbal one, which isn't as expensive, or they can give you a professional appraisal and give you a written appraisal. There is a cost for that in most cases. Um, it's usually around $100 or $150 an hour for anyone to do that. Uh, as far as... Um, uh, auctions go, auctions will let you know whether they want to sell your stuff or they don't want to sell your stuff. You can ask them if they can come and take a look and see what you have, but in most cases time is always seems to be so precious, they may want you to just take some pictures and send those pictures in and then they will let them let you know approximately what it might be worth and also if they are even interested in selling it. So realistically, for used furniture or household contents, it's about 10 to 15% of whatever you paid for it. You have to understand that when you purchase something, it depreciates just as a car does. For specialty items like fine art and crystal collections, uh, high-end furniture and antiques, um, they can be worth more, of course. So you may want to look at getting, make, make sure you're getting the right value on it and uh, get, a, get an appraisal. You may want to spend the money to do that if you have some very, very expensive items. 
Oh gosh, so where can you donate? Well, COVID has kind of um, put a little bit of a, uh, a damper on that because there's a lot of places that won't take donations um, because of COVID. Um, they are starting to open up now and we are able to actually donate um, most things, but there's always things that they won't take. So you need to be very careful to make sure that if you're gonna load up a truck or load up your car and take them to these places, that you know for sure they will take them. Sometimes they'll take cloth furniture, sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll take leather, sometimes they won't. Um, we're now getting some where they won't take any plush toys, they won't take um, any books, um, they won't take um, certain items that we used to be able to take. So just you know, check with them before you go and uh, start donating items. So you can go to charities, you can go to drop-in centers, Salvation Army. Um, there's also those little drop boxes that sometimes are, you know, around in a parking lot. You know, take a bag of clothing every every day, and if it's clothing or towels or some pillows or some decor that you don't want anymore, and just put them in the drop boxes, and that way you can get rid of some of that stuff yourself. And again, you can always go to your friends or your neighbors or somebody you know that needs things because when you're donating things, you're not going to get any return back. So if you have to hire somebody to take those things to donation, there's a cost to you and you won't be able to get anything back from that. Storage solutions. Okay, um, I always put in here only store things if it's necessary it's not ideal and i'll give you an example is that what happens a lot of times is people will put things in storage they pay every month and three or four or five years later they wonder why they're still paying those storage costs so make sure preferably that it's short-term storage that you're requiring but it's best just to get rid of stuff if you can so here's the different kinds of storage that you can get. So there's a self-storage, which is basically your storage lockers, uh, where you can come and go and put more in or take less out, or you need to make sure that you get the right size locker because there's only so much space in a storage locker. There's containers, there's those pod containers, sea cans. That's another uh, storage area where you can um, put things into a container, and then if you decide you want to have that delivered um, to another location, then you can you can have that. And the stuff only gets handled twice, so it goes in and then it comes out. And it's basically ideal if, for example, I've had situations where um, a client is moving into Amica and um, they're, they can't move in right away, but their house is already sold and they need to put their stuff somewhere temporarily. So that's where you would wear, use one of these containers. And you put all the furniture in, get the uh, pod container delivered to Amica, and then we unload it. And we've done this many times for our clients. Um, you can store at families' um, garage, but they probably won't want like it, so it's probably not a good idea to do that. Um, and then there's kind of like a warehouse pickup and delivery service. Um, that is, and I'm going to just mention this is what we have here in Calgary, and it's really for those couple of things that, you know, uh, for example, the antique sewing machine is gonna to go to your granddaughter and she's not in a place where she can receive it yet and you just wanna store it for, you know, say four or five or six months until she can receive it. You can find these type of warehouse type uh, storage facilities where you're basically only paying for the space you use and, um, and they can pick it up and they can deliver it for you. Okay, so we've dealt with things that you can sell and where you can sell. You've dealt with things that can be donated and get those donated. So now there's what's left. So you need to be able to recycle where possible. We are now in an area where we are environmentally conscious for sure. We want to try and recycle as much as possible, but also there's things that absolutely have to be recycled. You don't have a choice. You can't just take these things and dump them at the landfill. Um, the shredding services. I know there's people out there that will just shred for hours, um, but just know that there are shredding companies out there where they're fairly reasonable. So if you have a lot of paperwork that needs to be shredded, you can look into that. Um, paper, plastic, uh, contractor material, bottles, all of those things can be recycled. You just need to 
find out from your city what can be recycled and how it can be recycled. Medication. Um, if you have a lot of old medication, just take it out of the bottles, put it in a Ziploc, and drop it off at the pharmacy. They're great with that. They will properly dispense of that medication. So it shouldn't go down the drain and it shouldn't go into our landfill. Eyeglasses, that's another one. We end up accumulating all these eyeglasses. Usually the charities will take them, but um, some of the pharmacies will also accept eyeglasses. Electronics, all those old electronics, all of the old DVDs, all of those. Um, there are a lot of uh, charities that will actually um, take the electronics, but if they won't, um, then you can take it to the landfill. And they have these areas where you can drop off the electronics, the metals, and you know they've got these bins that you can put these things in. Old appliances, you've got that old fridge from the 1900s that is still sitting down in your basement. Well, that has to be recycled, and there's a cost for that. They need to take the free on out of all the fridges. Um, books, uh, again, check to see whether you can donate them, and if you can't, then you know we're going to have to try and recycle those as well. And most of the, the landfills have a place where you can drop off books. And for sure, for sure, for sure, what has to be recycled absolutely is any toxic, toxic chemicals, paints, or propane. You do not want to put that in the landfill. So those are things that can go to the landfill. And I always say this, my God, my husband is the dump guy, and he knows all this stuff all needs to be separated before he gets there because it all has to go in its special place. So make sure you understand um, the, um, the, pro the process. The landfill. Okay, this is the last resort, and I always say this. Uh, you need to try and limit as much as possible that can go to the landfill, but some things just have to go. If it's dirty, if it's broken, if it's contaminated, if it's not usable, it needs to go to the landfill. And how we handle the landfill is a couple of ways. If it's only a little bit, then you can truck it or you can put it in the, you know, the trunk of your car and take it that way and go to the landfill. But if it's a lot, then you may want to look into a disposal bin or a disposal service. Um, be careful when you're getting bins because if you are getting a bin, um, bins are charged per bin. So if you think you only need a small bin, um, make sure that's all you need because if it doesn't quite fit in there, you'll have to get another bin. And the, the extra cost for bins is the actual trucking of the bin, even though you're still going to pay for the weight. So if you have a lot, and get the biggest bin you can because it's then one trucking cost instead of two or three trucking costs. So we have now gone through the entire home and we have moved you into your new home and we have emptied it. Basically, the house is now empty. We've taken everything to auction, we've taken everything to donation, we've recycled, we've landfilled, we've now cleaned it, it's now ready to go. Um, maybe you're getting a stager in there to do some staging, maybe you did leave some furniture in there for staging, but regardless, now that you are not living in that home and it's on its own and it's vacant, you need to make sure that you've got a few things in place. Sometimes um, the realtor, whoever's listing it, will help you with a lot of these things. Um, so that's something you want to discuss with them when you're listing your home. Otherwise, you may have to try and hire a property manager or a neighbor or a family member that can go and visit it for insurance purposes. Please check your insurance policy, find out what your liability is when your home is vacant. It's either every 24 hours, 48 hours, or 72 hours. And there's no rhyme or reason. We don't understand why. Sometimes it's more or less. But you need to check with your insurance company and make sure that's covered and it's documented, whoever's doing these visits. Um, sometimes if something goes wrong, maybe the toilet isn't quite flushing properly, you may want to get somebody to help you with that, with some of those minor repairs. And of course, if you have a home that needs snow removal or lawn care, you need to make sure that that's in place while you're not there anymore. So check into that for sure, and what I always say about insurance is don't ask them what it covers, ask them what it doesn't cover, so that you know your, know what your issues are if something goes wrong in your home. Okay, so who's going to help? Oh gosh. So there's a couple of options here. You can either do it yourself, 
or if you're not physically able, or maybe you just don't want to do it yourself, then you can turn to family or friends, and we know how that goes sometimes. The guy with the truck kind of doesn't answer your phone call anymore, and family, they may live far away, they may, they may not be physically able to help you, or they're just too busy with their own life and they can't help you. So here's some ideas that you can go to. Um, we have our own little service here that we help our clients, but maybe what you want to do is you just want to do a Google, Google and um, check out to see what services are available. So check out, um, just Google Senior Downsizing Services, um, check out Professional Organizers. There's organizers out there will, that will actually help you get everything you need to go into your new space, your new right size space, they will help you design it, they'll hang all your pictures, they'll look after everything, and they will also have contacts that can deal with everything else after you've moved into your new place. You may want to Google senior packing and moving companies as well. So anything in that effect, you probably will find somebody that can help you. So in closing, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our company. Our company is Relocate Stress Free. Um, we've been in business since 2005. I basically got into this business because of um, my parents. Um, I lost my mom and dad within eight months of each other, and they were living in separate homes for over 30 years. They lived in another city, and I have a brother that lives in Florida. So I was left dealing with these two estates by myself, and I just found there was a real need for someone to be there to help people move or to help with an estate because there wasn't that resource out there because you just don't know where to go and what to do. And then Crate at Storage, my little storage company, was established 10 years later because our garage started getting filled up with all of our clients' items that we were nice enough to look after for them. Um, we work with corporate uh, trustees, um, executors, and power of attorneys of all the major trust companies. So when they're acting as an executor or a power of attorney, they hire us to deal with all of the contents in the home. Our job is to empty the house. So we go through the whole sorting, organizing, packing, um, disposal uh, service. And during that time, we also, and you may want to check across the country to see who else will do this for you, but if things have to be shipped somewhere out of the city, um, I mean, we've shipped things to Australia, to um, Japan, um, to Saudi Arabia, we've just, um, shipped things down to um, the United States, so there isn't anything, you know, that we haven't handled for these um, situations. We deal with estate lawyers and accountants and lots and lots and lots of realtors. Um, we also handle a lot of private clients um, if they're handling an estate or they're just moving and they're moving their family. So that's who we are and who we work with, and there are other companies across Canada that do that. So. I'm going to pass this on now because uh, I don't want to keep talking for too long because I sometimes get a little long-winded, but um, we're going to start looking at um, maybe some questions and answers um, that you may have, some questions you might have, and hopefully Claudia and I can answer those questions for you. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, and Claudia, thank you both for diving into this topic with us and sharing your experience. We greatly appreciate your time and want to thank you for giving us tips on how to navigate downsizing and have the most impact in a new space. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions. We received a few ahead of time, so we'll address them now. For Claudia, Anne from Vancouver asks, what design considerations will make the biggest impact in a small space? That's a great question, Anne, and I think that two things. First, I want, first, the first one would be scale. What do we mean by scale? It's basically an artsy way of saying size. You know, be practical, be reasonable. Don't try to, to fit you know, a five-person sofa into a small space. Try to, try to right size. For me, this is a key word. Try to find a piece of furniture that is the right dimension for the space you're working with. That would be number one scale. And secondly, pay a close attention to color. Small spaces show much better in lighter colors. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Claudia. Um, for Terry, um, Bob from Toronto would like to know, how far in advance of my move should I start downsizing? 
Well, like I mentioned before, it's it's great if they can move first, move in, and then go back and deal with everything that's left over. Um, and it also depends, like how big the house is. If he's in a, a 1,400 square foot condo, he's not going to need as much time as if he's got a 4,000 square foot three three story house with everything filled. But you know, you should probably start at least a month ahead. Um, if you get a service like ours anywhere across Canada. Um, honestly, we can do a whole job in four days, four to five days. So it depends whether you want to, you're a do-it-yourselfer or whether you're going to get somebody to look after it. But um, yeah, I'm thinking a month to two weeks you should consider starting. Great. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more question. So uh, for Claudia, Maureen from Ottawa would like to know, what sets Amica's design apart from other residences, especially with regards to memory care? Great, thank you for that question. I think it, it allows us the opportunity to reiterate how in Amica, design is very intentional. Every design feature is has an intent to enable environments, to make it more comfortable, to create an ambiance, and it is through the layering of these small details that we provide, you know, the, the, the overall, it comes together as a whole. So I think that what is, um, it's evidence-based, it's intentional, it's user-friendly, it's resident-centered. Thank you so much. Okay, I think that's about the time that we have now for questions. So we'll go back to Rebecca. Thank you both so much. Claudia and Terry, we can't thank you enough for joining us for today's seminar. To visit Amica and see Claudia's designs for yourself, contact your local Amica residents. We're happy to announce that Amica's Ontario residences are now available to host in-person tours. And our friends in the West are still providing wonderful virtual tours to all who are interested. We can't wait to connect with you. Today's attendees can enter to win a complimentary consultation with a downsizing specialist. Watch out for an email with more details on how to win. If you have any questions or you need assistance, please contact your local Amica's Community Relations Director. We thank everyone who joined us and encourage you to learn more about our upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at amica.ca. Our next national virtual event will be on Wednesday, July 29th. Summer, social distance, snacking. This will feature our very own national executive chef, Gary McBlain, as well as a mixologist to teach us how to make a cocktail using Amica's signature Metz tea. The Bright Spot is a segment featuring positivity and creativity from our wonderful residences. As we sign off, we hope you will enjoy watching some of these great moments we've had over the past couple of weeks. Until we meet again, stay safe and stay connected. Hey everyone, we're back this week with tons of summer content to shine a light on our amazing residences and what we've been up to over the past few weeks. Between Father's Day and Canada Day festivities, we've got ice cream, we've got vintage cars, we've got music, but most importantly, we're celebrating some very special graduates and the dads who bring us so much joy every day. It's all right here on The Bright Spot.
Thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. We hope you're enjoying this incredible weather and staying safe out there. One more very quick plug to follow us on both Facebook and Instagram at Amica Senior Lifestyles to see what else we're up to and also to join in on our very special Smiles for Seniors project. Please share your stories, share your photos, join our challenges, and help us spread this incredible movement of happiness and positivity to seniors everywhere. That's it for now. Thank you again so much for watching and we'll see you next time.